All right. Good morning, y'all. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to our locations. Everybody joining us online. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jared. Have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace. And it's such a joy to have you as we are into our series called Things We Do in Secret. And we're looking at where Jesus shows us there are opportunities for us in secret that God will meet us in that place. Last week, we talked about secret giving. This week, we're going to talk about, or Jesus is going to show us, secret praying. What a message. So let me pray, and we will get after it. Lord, thank you for all who are joining us. And I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts to the Scriptures and open the Scriptures to our hearts. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. I came across a story this week about a little boy, and he wanted a bicycle for Christmas. And so he went to his mom and said, Mom, I want to ask Santa for a new bicycle. And she goes, well, Matt, maybe you should ask Jesus instead to see if he might bring it to you. So it goes on to say that he first prayed to Jesus, and he said, Dear Jesus, I've really been a good boy this year, so will you please bring me a bicycle? Then he realized he wasn't being really honest about that. So he prayed again. He said, Jesus, you know, I've tried to be a good boy this year. So would you please bring me a bicycle? And he knew that wasn't straight up either. So he prayed, Lord, I've thought about being a good boy this year. So would you please bring me a bicycle? And he realized this wasn't working. Nothing was happening. He got very frustrated. One day he was walking past his neighbor's house, all frustrated about it. And he saw a nativity scene and, a, and in this little nativity scene was, was Mary, the mother of Jesus there. So he went and he grabbed this little figurine of Mary and took it home and wrapped it in blankets, stuffed it under his bed. And he prayed, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mom again, please send me a new bicycle. Yeah. Uh, prayer. Right? Prayer. What do we do with prayer? Prayer can seem so intimidating and so guilt-giving. I don't pray enough. And then what do I pray? And how do I pray? And what if I don't have the words to pray? And how should I pray? And all great questions. And that's what we're going to talk about a bit today is, is praying, the secret praying. And not just how to pray, not that we just should pray, but even why we pray. That's what Jesus gets after. And I love how the disciples meet you and me right where we are. The disciples didn't ask Jesus how to preach. They didn't ask Jesus how to heal. They asked Jesus how to pray. So even they struggled with prayer. And so we're going to see it from a different angle, though, and that Jesus isn't just, going to, is, just isn't approaching us in how to pray, but also the motivations and intentions of why we pray. So we'll look at it here in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 5 through 8. So as we saw last week, this, this one sentence sets up everything else in secret. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Verse 5, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So we see first before we even get into praying and secret praying, we see there's only one way that God's going to hear your prayers at all. And it has to do with this word righteousness. Righteousness means a righteousness that you receive through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Without Christ, you and I are seen as unrighteous before God, sinful before God. And there's nothing we can do about it. You can't keep most of the commandments. None of that will work. Only one who is righteous can make us right. So Jesus goes on the cross and took our unrighteousness, died with it for what we deserve, rose on the third day showing we have victory in him. And through faith in him, he gives us his righteousness. And now we are seen as the children of God, orphans no more. And that's the only way you'll be heard by God through prayer is through Jesus Christ. 
The Hebrews writer picks this up, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. So, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. That's where God dwells. Because of the blood of Jesus. That's the only way you're hurt. Because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened up a new and life-giving way through the curtain. That's the temple veil back in the day that... that shielded, kept mankind away from God's presence there that represented his presence through the curtain into the most holy place where God resides. And since we have a great high priest, only the high priest could go into the presence of God who rules over God's house, this is Jesus, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting in him. The only way your prayers are heard is through Jesus Christ. That's it. Only through his blood. Only by him making the way. Think of it like this. So there's a story around Abraham Lincoln's son. It has to do with a soldier. A soldier, his, his father, his, his brother was killed in war. So he had a mom and a sister who were on their own. So he wanted to have an audience with President Lincoln to see if he could get an exemption from war so he could go home and take care of his mother and sister and plow the land and so forth. So he tried to get an audience with President Lincoln and he was shut down at every corner. No, he could not go into the president's presence. All the guards, the soldiers would not let him go. So he sat down very distraught and Abraham Lincoln's son walked up to him. He is the soldier and said, are you okay? What happened? And he told his son the problem. And he said, I just really need an audience with your dad, the president. And the son said, come with me. And the soldier went with the son and no one questioned the son. The son, son walked right past the, the soldiers, right past the guards and walked right into the office, interrupting everything with President Lincoln. Lincoln and President Lincoln looked up and said, who's your friend, son? And he said, this is so-and-so and he's here and here's what's happened. And and the, and the soldier spilled out his heart, and President Lincoln listened to him, and then he gave the soldier an exemption. That's, in a sense, an image of what it means when you pray in Jesus' name. The Son escorts you into the Father's presence. You cannot go into his presence. Only the Son can bring you into his presence because of what he's done for you on the cross. So if you miss everything else today, that's okay. This is the one you want to get right because this is the only way God will listen to you through Christ Jesus. Are you with me? Yes. Now, from there, now what do we do in terms of secret praying? I got five marks for you, five marks that we find in this passage of praying in secret. And here's the first one. Pray relationally. Pray relationally. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. That was shocking, mind-blowing to his audience in that day. Because when you prayed, you prayed in the temple or toward the temple. And he say, no, go to a secret place in a room and even shut the door. And he's blowing minds because for the first time he's saying, Father. They didn't pray like that. They prayed prayers like, oh, sovereign Lord. And Jesus simply comes with Father, mind-blowing to them in that day. It, it, and how intimate that is to be in the Father's presence and talk like a child. Just express yourself as you. No fancy flowery things. And we get to see him as Father. It reminds me, I've, sh I've shared this in the past, about when my sons were little, we had a neighbor over and the neighbor kept calling me Jared. So I pulled him over and I said, listen, you're really supposed to call me Mr. Jones. And later on that day, Titus, my little one, was in the room and he came up to me. He goes, uh, Mr. Jones, can I have some? I'm like, no, no, Mr. Jones, I'm daddy. I'm your father. You call me daddy. So in the same way, we look at God and there's this intimate relationship we have with him, unlike any other religion can understand, and it's a relationship with this father. And it's a father in which you can walk into his presence and interrupt him. And that's the point, isn't it? Because religions, many religions say, oh, praying to God like father, that's so, that, that's so irreverent. But that's the point. He invites us in, the, in an irreverent way in calling him father, father. You know, I'm, I'm a father who loves my kids, and I have a hard time when they interrupt me. But God does not have a hard time when you interrupt him. He invites it. 
because he's the perfect father. But that can be tough for many of us. It can depend on the father you grew up with. We can often interject or project the relationship we have with our earthly fathers upon our perfect heavenly father. So if you had a cold and distant earthly father, then you may see God as cold and distant or hostile or annoyed or stingy or just harsh. I remember 2020, the Pope was shaking hands and some lady took his hand and wouldn't let go and he slapped her hand. And many of us can have that idea of God that why would I want to pray to a God when he's hostile to me? Why would I pray to, why would I, no wonder I dread or no wonder prayer is so out there for me because it just seems I'm approaching someone who, who's annoyed by me or who's, who doesn't give me an audience who will slap my hand because of the way I've been. But Jesus is saying, no, this is a father that you'll never be perfect for. That's why Christ is perfect for you. And you enter in his presence through Christ the Lord. Matthew 6, 8, do not be like the Gentiles for your father knows what you need before you ask him. We'll see more about the Gentiles in a moment, but he says he knows what you need before you ask him. And I ask the question of this, so why should I ask him if he already knows what I need? But that's exactly the point. Jesus is saying that's exactly why you should ask him because he already knows what you need. He has, he's has, he has his attention on you. He knows your heart, your struggle, your needs. He watches you that closely in love because he's daddy, he's father who is for you and not against you. And he invites us to ask of him. And sometimes it's not in the sense that we're asking for God, we're asking for ourselves so we can hear ourselves, so we can vent ourselves to say, I, I need you ultimately. That's the ultimate prayer, not to get from God, but to get God in Christ Jesus. And then the overflow of that is to, to, to receive the needs that we have from him. But do you ask him? Do you pray? Do you pray? Do you come before him only as mister or do you come before him as dad? And you talk to him as a child would talk. You don't have to have the flowery speech. And then do you ask? Do you come knowing he's your deepest need or do you only want enough of God that you don't need him? Just enough. Otherwise, prayer, lack of prayer shows in my life that I got my life handled. I got enough resources, I got enough uh, of, of security, and therefore prayer is not a big deal for me, unless I'm in a crisis. But yet, God invites us to come and ask. I, I love what Dr. Tim Keller says here about, about asking and why we should ask. I'm just going to read it, wrote it in my notes here. He says, there are all kinds of things God wants to give you, but will not give you until you pray and ask, because they're not safe to give you unless you know where they came from. So that's why we ask to see if God, seek God to answer us. I read this little book years ago when our boys were born, and it was a father-son book, and it was all these pages of how to be a good dad to your boys throughout their lives. And I remember out of everything, I remember this one page, this one little page with one little sentence on it that said, take your son's calls forever. And that is the heart for my children. I will take their calls forever. When we have staff meetings, we have a policy. We, don't, we, don't, we are not on our phones in staff meetings, but we have our phones in staff meetings in case, in case our families call. And so take your son's calls forever. Take God saying, I will take your calls forever. I'll take your texts forever. I'll take your interruptions forever because he's a good father. But do you see him that way? Or instead, do you see him as an ogre, hostile, cold, harsh, mean, stingy? And the point Jesus is making is saying, no, he's father. Perfect. Pray relationally like a child. So secret praying involves praying relationally. Second, it involves praying regularly, praying regularly. Matthew chapter six, verses five and seven talks about when you pray, when you pray. Jesus says, when you pray, I think three times in that passage. So in other words, it's not we should pray. Jesus is taking it for granted that we are praying. Praying in some way, some fashion, because we feel a need to know the one who made us, the need to know the one who gave himself for us. 
and the need to be dependent on him and the resources he can give you and me from the emotional to the, to the physical resources in our lives. So we see in scripture in the Old Testament, we see people, the Jews, prayed at different times during the day, like nine o'clock, noon, three o'clock. So there are specific times you can pray. You can also, well, let me just stop there and ask you this. It doesn't matter the time you pray, nine, three, or, or nine, noon, three, but do you pray at a specific time every day? Have you made that a priority in your life to take a, a, a bit of time and just say, that time I'm gonna give to the Lord in prayer, those times? Here's the way I, I've, I've heard it before that's very helpful. Uh, again, this is Dr. Tim Keller, his wife calling him out on his prayer life. And she said, imagine that you have a pill and you have to take that pill every night at 11 p.m. And if you miss taking that pill, even one time, you will be dead by morning. The question was, would you ever forget to take that pill? Would you ever go, I, oh, I forgot about the pill? Or I didn't make time enough for the pill? No one would do that because there's a need for the pill. In the same way, that's prayer. It's I don't want to miss a moment. I don't want to miss a time because I need him. He is my breath. He is my life. Prayer is like breathing. And it's more without ceasing that it is than it is at a certain time. In other words, you don't go, at noon today, I'm going to breathe. No, you just, you're already breathing. So prayer becomes like breath. We see this with Jesus. By the way, Jesus prayed in public more than he did in private. So there's a, yes, let's pray in public, but he prayed in private too. He took, a, he took back certain times of the day. He would go in solitude, but he also prayed without ceasing in his heart and his mind. That's why in the letter of John, he says, I, I only say what I hear my father saying. I only do what I see my father doing. So he had this constant connection. And if Jesus needed that constant connection, how much you and me? And so this pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, the apostle Paul talks about. You know what that word in the, the, the original language means, this without ceasing? It means the image is a persistent cough. It's allergy season. Anybody got that persistent cough yet? That kind of tickle? You, you wake up in the middle of the night, you're kind of coughing, you sit down to eat your cereal, you kind of cough, you're going about your day, you're, you're having to shield your cough and freaking everybody out because you don't have a mask on. But you know, you have the, you have the, that, that's, that's the image we're to have with praying without ceasing. It's like we get up in the middle of the night, we're, 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 we're praying, we go about our day, we're praying. It's that kind of life. So how, how, how are you doing with the persistent praying? And that's the beauty of it. You pray relationally from the heart with the mindset that I'm connected to my father. But I know many times in many lives, you rarely give thought, God a thought during the day. That, so that shows we're not leaning and depending on him. So it's exactly the opposite. It's to have such a relationship more and more with the father that you persistently within, you pray in need of him. You pray. So praying relationally in secret, praying regularly in secret. Thirdly, pray sincerely. Pray sincerely. Matthew 6, 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So what happened? Because in the, in the context of the day, these religious hypocrites are doing everything right. They're standing, and that was the practice back in the day. When you prayed, you prayed standing. They prayed in the synagogues. They prayed in the churches. That's exactly what you did in the synagogues. You prayed in the churches. Oh, but they prayed in the street corners. You would also do that. If you're walking down the street and there's the call to pray, you would, stay, st you would stop right where you were, and you begin praying. So everything's, everything's in motion. Everything looks good until this part, to be seen by others. That's where it went wrong. And they're called hypocrites because they're not really praying to God. They're praying just to hear themselves. They're praying to get it over with. There's no heart behind it. D.A. Carson in his commentary on this, he asks these questions. Listen to this. Do I pray more frequently and fervently when alone with God or only in public? Is public prayer an overflow of my private prayer? What do I think of when I'm praying in public? Or if you say, I only pray in private, all right. In private, are you still a spectator of your own performance? Or your prayer is not answered because maybe you're not sincere. 
So this is what Jesus is gathering for us to consider in our own hearts. He talks about this reward we will get. The reward means a transaction with the receipt. So the transaction with the receipt, if we pray to be seen by others or we want somebody to, or we take a selfie of ourselves on our knees at a prayer bench or doing, reading our Bible, then the receipt you get of reward is the likes from social media. It's a bit of that understanding. I think of prayer also, so, so to bring it a little closer to us, to way, way to think about it, I think about it in terms, there are three types of people who pray. Now there's the one taken for granted who prays rightly, and there's though the other three. And I have found myself here on these in the past. It's the prayer police, it's the prayer professor, and it's the prayer performer. The prayer police are those who police what everybody else is praying. So in other words, if some, for example, someone's praying, oh, Father, we love you, we love you. Then the next person standing, sitting beside them prays, Lord, we love you, and we know you're Father, but you're also Son and Holy Spirit. And so we pray, see what I'm saying? So it's the prayer police to kind of correct that. Then there's the prayer professor. It's someone who prays and they pray very, you know, they pray to the Lord. And it's the next person that says, Lord, we understand that. But Lord, we also pray because you are a God who gives us propitiation for our sanctification. And, and off you go, you know, instructing us in the big words of scripture. And then there is the prayer performer. And there can be the, 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 the sanctification, propitiation. It can be all of that as well. Or it can be the these and the thous that I grew up with in KJV land back in the South. It can be flowery language, all of that. And what it comes down to is who is that really for? And it comes down to is that seeking the Lord? Is it sincere, sincere prayer? And you know, I list all threes, I've, all three of those. I've been all three of those. So we're in this together. Pray sincerely. How else? Well, Matthew 6, 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. So the Gentiles worshiped all kinds of gods, little g gods. And the way they would worship these gods is they would pray and they would pray repetitively and, and mumbly. It would just roll out and they would just go over and over and over and over and over and over again. Empty phrases. We too can pray these empty phrases. We can do this. I know for me, I can pray an empty prayer before a meeting. It can, you can pray an empty prayer before dinner. If you sit down to pray, you just kind of have this mantra prayer over the food, almost like a lucky rabbit's foot, or just so you have the you do the right thing. My kids laugh at me. They're like, dad, we know when you're hungry because your prayers are very short. <laughs> and that's fact. So we can have this issue in our lives and it's, it's empty phrases like these incantations or rituals or, or reciting something or formulas. And we get more, con more concerned by what we're saying and how we're saying it than it being prayed to God. The word literally means babble. Babble means to mumble mumble and get it over with, to mumble it like a lucky rabbit's foot. That's like Buddhists have a prayer wheel that they'll literally carry with them everywhere to make them look really holy and they do the prayer wheel to pray and mumble their prayers. Muslims have the beads that they pray through, also the 99 names of Allah that they'll mumble through. Also, you know, all of us, I know in the Catholic world, it's rosary beads and it's Hell Marys and all that. I know for all Christians, it can be a formula of prayer you pray through or praying through a, a, a verse and you just mumble it out. I know this year I've committed to pray through a specific section of the Psalms every day, the same text every day, all year. And I am battling for it not to be babble. Because you pray it and pray it and pray it so much, you almost become, in a sense, you kind of dread praying it because you're praying it so much. And then you just pray in it like a lucky rabbit's foot, just pray it. Okay, I got my lucky rabbit's foot, all's well with God. I did my thing and off I run. I'm in it too. We're all in this. And Jesus says, take some inventory. Is that where you are? And he says it this way, Matthew 15, eight. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And that's the danger is we can get into a place in our own lives for Christ or in our prayers that we mumble plenty, we pray plenty with our lips, but our hearts not be in it. And Jesus calls that out. Here's how prayer should look. Lamentations 2.19. Arise, cry out in the night as the watches of the night begin. Pour out your heart like water in the presence of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? 
the invitation of God through the prophet to pour out your heart like water. So it seems like there can be two different kinds of prayer here between the water and then lips and not heart. It's pouring your heart out like water or spitting in the wind with no meaning, no heart behind it. And here Jesus, you know, here's what Jesus is after. Jesus is saying, I want your prayer life to flourish. I want God to hear your prayers. I want you to experience the presence of God in your prayers so much that he warns us how God won't hear our prayers. What a joy that Jesus would do this for us. So praying sincerely, pour your heart out. As you pray, does that speak of you? Are you more pour your heart out or more, to put it crassly, spitting in the wind? Do you pour your heart out? Do you express yourself like a child before the Father? You're never gonna have the joy of prayer or the meaning of prayer or the life in prayer without pouring your heart out sincerely. So secret prayer involves praying relationally, praying regularly, praying sincerely, also praying simply, simply. Matthew 6, 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Listen, praise God, he is all about short prayers. Anybody? I've been in situations where I'm supposed to go into a room and pray for 30 minutes and I'm handed this little list. I'm supposed to pray through it through 30 minutes. I pray through it in eight minutes. What am I supposed to do with the other 22 minutes, anybody? And so we see this, that Jesus is saying often in our prayer life, less is more. You can pray very shortly from the heart and it can be powerful like a laser beam in a sense to pour our hearts out in such a simple way. He says that these Gentiles pour out these words, these religious people pray, pour out these words thinking they will be heard for their many words. And we kind of have this in us, don't we? Think about it. I feel like sometimes the more I talk in prayer, the more God will listen. I just got to talk longer and that then he'll see I really, really mean it. Or we think if we use more words, then God will know I'm being really, really sincere or we think if we're more repetitive with something, that so repetitive we impress ourselves. So therefore, God must be impressed, therefore, to answer our prayers. Do you ever go there? Do you ever think that? But then at the same time, we look in Scripture and we do see prayers repeated. We do see Jesus calling us to pray at length. Jesus would pray all night. Paul and his thorn had a thorn in his side. He called it a thorn in his side. He prayed several, three times that God would take away his thorn. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prayed three times that the cup might pass from him, this suffering. Also, Jesus says, when you pray, he says to ask, seek, knock. That sounds like a lot of praying. Because you, when, you, when you knock, you don't just go, you go. That sounds like a lot of praying. And then he says in Luke 18, 1, pray and don't give up. So which is it, Jesus? It sounds very confusing. Well, first, to pray often, it means you pray from a burdened heart, not as a lucky rabbit's foot. See, it's motives and intentions. So if you pray at length, if you have a long prayer, if you use many words, is it rabbit's foot prayer? Is it God will, must hear me if I pray so much? Or is my heart is breaking and I can't help but keep praying this over and over again that God might answer? And then he says to pray and don't give up. That, that's not about the length of one's prayer, but overcoming the tendency to give up praying. Do you tend to give up praying? So we, we cannot give up praying with the help of it can be short prayers before the Lord that's meant with all of our heart. And God hears, the Father hears. Listen to this Ecclesiastes verse. It says, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. That's to be an encouragement that a few words can be so meaningful to God, to God. Mm. You know, the Lord's Prayer in this passage of the Beatitudes is four sentences long and you can read it in 20 seconds. You can also pray it with meaning in about 45 seconds to a minute. 
And Jesus says, this is the model prayer. That's the prayer that launches us into our prayer lives. Such a simple prayer. Then there's Luke 18, where there's this religious leader kind of selfishly prays a prayer, but it's very long and kind of ornate. Then you have the sinner, the tax collector who prays, and he simply prays seven words. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And God says that the sinner was justified for his prayer. Seven words. Seven words. There have been many times in my life I came before the Lord and said, Lord, all I got today is this. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Come before the Lord. The scriptures say that the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf when we don't have the words. Many times to come before the Lord and say, I don't have the words today. Holy Spirit groan on my behalf. See, so God is for you in prayer. God is for you in this relationship with him in prayer as well. That's why I've shared with you in the past my three go-to prayers. One, please. Two, help. Three, please help. <laughs> with a heart behind it, God hears. So are you praying simply? We tend to make prayer so complicated and we underestimate it at the same time. And we find it's relational. We find it's the breath we breathe. breathe. We find it can be succinct, short, potent. See, Jesus is using all this to inspire you to pray. Praying is not for super spiritual people. It's for you and me. Regular people with regular lives. I know I'm a pastor and I should be praying more and I hope I do. But what I'm saying is just as a man and a Christian and for you in your regular life with all those temptations and battles and struggles and fears, prayer is a gift to you from the Father. Go to him in prayer and pray simply. So where are we? Pray relationally, regularly, sincerely, simply. And then finally, when you pray, pray separately. Have a place where you separate from the noise and the distractions of the world to be in the solitude with God in Christ. Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So he says, go into this room, shut the door. What's this room? Here's the image Jesus used with the language there. It is a room where you keep your treasures your savings, you might say. Your, your, and you would go into this room and only you would go into this room for the concern that if anyone else came into the room, they would see what you have and would want it. Or two, someone would come into the room and know what you have. So Jesus is saying, go into this very private place. It's a physical place, but it also can be a private place in your heart and a public place. But go into that room and not enough to go into the room. Go into the room and shut the door. Lock out all the distractions and the noise and go into that place that no one knows you. No one has access to know who you really are and what you really are and what you really have within you, but only the Father does. And then express that, the one who will never turn you away or the one who will never roll his eyes at you and pour out your heart like water before him. So separate yourself and you will receive the reward. The reward means God will, you have this prayer transaction, for lack of better words, and he hands you a receipt. What's that receipt? The receipt ultimately is him. The receipt is himself. The receipt is the experience of his presence. Not every time. There'll be times you go in there, and I do too. You start praying, and you wake up five minutes later and wonder what happened. You got slap, you dry, you slap running down your chin, and you wonder what happened, where have I been? You don't even know where you are. Some of the best sleep you've had in days. It happens, but you know what? At least you showed up. I wonder if sometimes if 80% of it is that you just show up and the Father sees your heart to show up, mindful that you and I are but dust. He knows our frame. So you show up to the Father and he can have the receipt of himself or he gives you the receipt of an answered prayer. I don't, I, I've heard it recently. Here's how God answers prayer. Ready? Here's how he'll answer your prayer. Because in a sense, he does always answer prayer. And he can answer it like this. His answer could be yes. His answer could be no. His answer could be maybe. His answer could be not that, but instead this. Or as I heard recently, or his answer could be, you got to be kidding me right now. It could be that. You're asking for that. All right. So you always have an answer from the Father. And he will never, ever give you what's bad for you. 
what's wrong for you. Now, you can choose to do your own thing, but he's always for you. And I know there are some times I go in prayer and I know exactly what's best for me. And I pray, Lord, this is what's best for me. And God goes, yeah, you know what? You're three pound gray matter in your brain. I'm the oceans. I got you. I know what's best. And you trust him like a father who will give you good things. So you pray separately in that way to the father. So what it means is you shut the world out. When you pray, if you're praying without ceasing in public or you're praying in the car or wherever that may look at the park, you're shutting the world out and you're going into that inner room and shutting the door in your heart. And then literally it means you can go somewhere in your house and maybe there is nowhere, but only if you get up earlier in the morning or stay up later at night, then you have the private room or the privacy you need to separate from the noise and the distraction of the world. So it's shutting everything and everyone else out and coming before the Father. So let me give you some thoughts to take home this week that may help you, maybe help you even get going a bit in this journey of secret praying. I'll go ahead and give them to you all up front. First, there's place, then psalm, ponder, pray. Place, psalm, ponder, pray. So the place, think about right now a physical place. Where's a physical place in your home, in your world, at your office, at the park, in the car, whatever that looks like. Get you a place, a private place where you shut the door. You shut everything else out. And it's you and the Father. Also, pray the Psalms. It can be difficult praying and what to pray and how to pray. Go to the Psalms. The Psalms are emotional. The Psalms are spiritual. The Psalms are cries and praise, praises. They can give words for you. Billy Graham once said he read a proverb every day to help him in relationships with people, and he read a psalm every day because it helped him in his relationship with God. So go to the psalms, pray, read a psalm, read through the psalms and pray it. But how? Pondering what you read, pondering what you read. So, uh, you know, a person who has a falling apart Bible usually has a life that's not falling apart. So that's why you go to the Psalms specifically. That's why you ponder the Bible, ponder the Psalms in your heart. Ponder means meditate. You meditate on it. There, there's a big movement today of, being, of meditating. Well, you don't just meditate on nothing. Meditate on God and his word in Christ Jesus. You know what meditate means? It means to chew the cud. It's like a, 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 a cow. They chew, they chew, chew, chew. They bring it down, then they bring it back up, and they chew, chew, chew. And they bring it down, and they bring it back up. Chew, chew, chew. That's cut, chewing the cud. That's the, what meditating is. It is to digest what you're reading, then bring it back up and ponder it and, and, and savor it. You know, maybe like hard candy as well. You just savor it, savor it in that way. And when you read it, you're listening for God's voice, if you will. Do you know that God speaks first? When God created Genesis 1 and 2, God did all the speaking. We didn't start speaking to God until Genesis 4. And it says in Genesis 4, then they began to seek the Lord. So God's always speaking. And you can know he's speaking through his word. I've always known that if you say God's not speaking to you, it must be that you're not reading your Bible. He's always speaking. And then finally, pray what you read. Pray God's word back to God. The Psalms are important. Uh, listen to this quote. He says, we learn prayer vocabulary the way children do. You get immersed in it and then you speak it back. So in the same way, prayer vocabulary, you get immersed in the Psalms, in the scriptures, and then you speak it back. You pray it back to the Lord. And then it starts becoming a part of your bones, part of your DNA and how God meets you in that place. So, so which one today will you take home? Is it you need to pray relationally? Do you need to pray regularly or pray sincerely or simply? Or maybe it's you just need to pray, period, and to pray separately. In these ways, the Father who's in secret will meet you there. And that's what you want more than anything else. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for the invitation to come to you through Christ Jesus, to be heard. We are not orphans. We are loved by the Father, and we praise you. Help our unbelief move and motivate our hearts to see our own needs, that we would pray to you like breathing, pouring out our hearts like water, 
expressing ourselves just as we are heard by you in Christ. We praise you, Jesus. Thank you for this gift and the gift of you. And it's in your great name I pray. We all said amen. amen.